I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to a special Campobello Island edition of Southwest Magazine. With the fog rolling in behind me, you can see where the Arts, Music and Heritage Festival Fog Fest gets its name. On today's episode, we'll be looking at highlights from last year's Fog Fest, as well as sitting down with Teresa Mitchell to find out what we can anticipate for Fog Fest 2021. Fest really started from it was a group of women and Steve Marion and we decided that was the same summer that the Anchorage campground in Graminan closed their provincial campground and we thought we need to do something it's of the utmost important for us to save these jobs here in this area so we decided we'd do a festival I was actually cleaning at Stephanie Golf's grandmother Alice Golf's house and Stephanie and I were talking and I she said we've got to do something and I said well, let's have a festival and we'll call it Fog Fest because we know we'll always have fog. And she zipped across the road to the post office. Kathleen Case actually works there. And that was it. I mean, those two women were really instrumental. They're powerhouses. And from that came the first Fog Fest. And we're getting ready to do the ninth Fog Fest. And year one, we had a $4,000 budget and we're up and growing. and you know, highlighting all of the Charlotte County musicians and musicians and artists and the heritage of the entire province. Fog Fest was the only festival I was able to go to last year just because of COVID restrictions, but because of the way Fog Fest is, we, people were watching in the back of pickup trucks from boats, even watching from the harbor. How did you manage to pull it off last year despite all the things the world was going to? We actually run three consecutive days and then we had other shows throughout. Mm -hmm. It was an emotional experience for the, the people watching in the audience. I know it brought me to tears just because it had been so long since I experienced an event, but even Sean Richard was one of the musicians I spoke to afterwards who said for a musician, it was, one of the, it was the first time he was able to play to a crowd last year. There were a lot of festivals lined up for the summer and of course um, a lot of them couldn't happen that I was supposed to be playing at. So actually being here and being able to actually be at a festival it was just it was like it's probably to date the highlight of my summer now because I'm able to like say that I did get to play one festival this summer so yeah it was pretty cool and it's a whole new dynamic like a drive-in concert that's so cool so I'm still not used to it like looking out and seeing people sing into your music um, especially the the first song that I wrote there um, with my uncle Eloy Richard so that song's been a legend in in um, New Brunswick for the last few years so that's really cool but and then my new songs that are come out when I see people know the words to that. Um, it's a really cool feeling. It makes you feel really good. Yeah, it was without a doubt that I wanted to come over here and be a part of this. But I can't Cause I'm too far gone I'm gonna drive so far Drive so fast But one way road Don't ever look back You didn't try To make this last And it's too late now Covered up my tracks Too many wrongs Don't make no rights I couldn't take just the one more Fight now I'm gone, you're gone, and I'm driving alone in the middle of the night. Every 50 miles, I question myself Is it you? Is it me? What else could it be? Moon shining in 50 more miles to go. I'll do it all. We realized that if we were really going to do what we wanted to do to make sure that these artists continued to play and people continue to enjoy that talent, then last year was probably our most important year because in the light of everything else that was going on, here are these artists that are struggling and if we were going to make a difference, it was our time to either stand up and be heard or sat down and, and shut up. Mm -hmm. And we decided to stand up. Yeah, and artists like Nick Gay were there, who's pretty accomplished, has toured with Tom Cochran, and I understand he's even more involved with Fog Fest this year. I'm 
I'm glad to be back doing it. You know, everybody seems to be following the rules. There's little bubbles going on. That's all good stuff. So, you know, um, yeah, it's it's good. It's good to be back and have people out enjoying something. You know, we need. That's what everybody needs. I started doing some work for Tom when I was like uh, 18 or 19. Just a couple side side man gigs, and it turned into uh, you know. A lot of different stuff. I played on one of his albums. I did some engineering on another album, um, you know, recording Greer, and actually I put a few guitar parts on on that album. And uh, and I was his touring guitarist for for a year or so. And so you know, we stay in touch, and you know, he's a great guy. And uh, that, yeah, we had, we had fun out there. <laughs> it's been a, been a while though. He's wonderful. I mean, he has ties to not. I mean, he's he's from Charlotte County, but not only is he from Charlotte County, he has ties to Campobello. His grandfather actually was a pastor that came and worked with the Edith Lang Memorial Christian Camp on the island. So it's almost like we're bringing him back home. Mm -hmm. So it's you also make an effort at Fog Fest to showcase very local talent. Cassidy Cook, I believe, has not missed a Fog Fest. Her dad's. Graham Cook's roots are from the island. Graham's also an incredible musician, as is their son, Nicholas. And he, Nick's played a few times with us as well. So it's always so nice to be able to have those local connections. So now that some of our restrictions have lifted, I'm glad that we are able to get together and have a little bit of art going on in the community, music and stuff. I know that there have been some painters involved as well. So I think it's a, it's well needed from everybody. But even if you just come check out the lighthouses, there's a lot of really beautiful nature trails like out towards the Roosevelt Park. We've got lots of beautiful scenery and there's camping, there's the golf course, what more could you want? I grew up as a kid here on the island who was very, very musical and there wasn't necessarily like a lot of resources to support that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just the reality of where we live. And uh, Fogfest has been a great uh, musical event for people here on the island for a long time. It brings people from the island as well as from away every year that come and enjoy not just the music but as well as our community so we're really lucky to have it kind of try to stick close to home and then branch out from there. But over the years we've, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I had never realized the amount of talent that this area was actually producing until I got involved with Fog Fest. Something we should talk about, actually it's free. It's free. It's free. Yeah. So how does that work for, for people? It, it, they just show up to whatever venues yep. they... Yeah. And you get to see whatever artists will post our schedule closer to the date when we work out all of the tweaks and any, you know, the, the main stage is really the campground in Heron Cove. We did it by the beach last year because the campground with its COVID rules, which it had to enforce, mm -hmm. could only allow campers in. So by doing it at the beach, it allowed the people, as you said, in the boats to come, people in their trucks to come, everyone could set up and and see the see the shows and really enjoy. One of the stars of Fog Fest is obviously the island itself. So yes. is that important to integrate the backdrop of the beauty of the island into Fog Festival and pick locations that speak to what make Campobello so special? It is. It certainly is. Um, I think that we want people to see the beauty that we have. We want people to come and to be able to enjoy it. And in the true maritime spirit, we want everyone to love it the same way that we do. Mm -hmm. It's it is truly about that island and in this area. Can you talk a little bit about the art side of Fog Festival? It's it's more than just a music festival. You integrate local art yep. into the festival yep. as well. We do. Um, it's music, heritage, arts, and culture. So I think you just kind of hit the culture with your little campfire sing-along. <laughs> That's really the East Coast culture. That's what we do. If you know, if somebody's in the crowd that has a guitar, or if you happen to have a set of spoons or a tambourine, 
everyone joins in. Mm -hmm. But the arts, the artist, I mean, Joyce Morales, you, I'm sure you've seen her work. Mm -hmm. She's incredible. I was lucky enough to visit Joyce Morell at She's Owen House, the historic <laughs> Owen House. So that's a great place to go yes. to, to see some of her mm -hmm. art. The summer visitors are a lot of fun. We get to know them. And they also love it here. It's, it's uh, an, an island is an island, right? It's a, con it's a contained condition, you know, just a little area where you know everybody and, and nothing much changes. That's kind of a nice thing now. It's, I've always painted ever since. I started when I was three and it's just part of my life. I, I don't, I'm not happy if I don't paint. I like to do landscapes. I like to do port animal portraits. I like to do flowers. The park is wonderful to paint in. And I like it around here. This, this old house is interesting. I used to think that people were bored, but now they get off and they come in and they say, oh, isn't it quiet, isn't it lovely? Look how beautiful it is. Oh, we can sit on the front yard. <laughs> We've been so lucky this year. We actually were able to hire two students, two local students, to work with us on Fog Fest. Um, they're going to be instrumental in doing the opening ceremony. The heritage part of FogFest always does that opening ceremony and we display the local students art during that. They're also doing another mural this year. It'll be the international border. I actually got a picture of the bridge when the sun was going down. I thought that was pretty... Yeah, the bridge has always been a symbol of friendship for Campobello and Lubeck for us and, and it has a lot of meaning for all the people on Campobello. It's our connection to the mainland plus it's a symbol of, of a very rare relationship between two cross-border communities. So the, the picture will have quite a bit yeah. of meaning. Yeah. Of course that's a huge part of Campobello is our bridge so it's nice to have that highlighted as, mm -hmm. as well in this. So with two new students it, it'll be unbelievable and Landon Murray he's a young man we were fortunate enough to hire mm -hmm. he's really an incredible artist it seems much like Nick he puts me in mind of Nick he can play pretty much anything thinking of the International Bridge obviously the year Campobello's had with with Roosevelt Park and and, and the state there the summer estate being such a huge draw for tourism with so many of your tourists usually coming from the United mm -hmm. States because it's a huge part of their history um, as your role on the Tourism Association for the island how did you pivot amid COVID-19 when you weren't able to welcome American guests and and did you find that this was maybe the, a time that many more Canadians and New Brunswickers discovered the island. As a historic area, we were probably, you know, really well known for the history, mm -hmm. but we have miles and miles of beautiful natural areas and hiking trails, and your Canadian tourists are much more interested in adventure tourism. Mm -hmm. So we had to try to, you know, gear ourselves more to that market than what we had been doing really in the past. So it was a huge change. I will say I did spend a lot of time on the island last year, especially when we weren't able mm -hmm. to travel. And it was my favorite place to discover in New Brunswick more than I already had before. But there were a lot of cyclists, as you mentioned, discovering fr uh, going to Friars Head to the beautiful lighthouses. What, as a representative of tourism for the island, are the, the must-see places in, in your mind, if you were telling someone your top five? If I was going to visit Campobello as a tourist, of course I would always do the Roosevelt Park. But by saying the Roosevelt Park, I mean not only the historical homes, but go across that road. Mm -hmm. The Roosevelts didn't come to Camp Bello to stay in that cottage. That's not at all what they did. They were across the road. They were hiking. They were biking. They were doing all of those things out in that natural areas. They were having tea in the tea house out on Lake Glen Severn. That was where they spent their time. They came in the pursuit of outdoor activities. That house was, and you all know when you go in the Roosevelt Cottage and see the size of those bedrooms, that's exactly what those people came back to that cottage to do after they'd had a full day of fun activities. When I look at the Roosevelt Cottage, I think of the friendship between Canada and the United States. They called it their beloved island because it was a place where they could escape all that craziness with 
anything to do with politics, anything to do with the city or the limelight. And it was just Franklin from a young age, actually when he was just a young boy, eight years old, um, he had a very close relationship with a man named Toma Joseph. And if you come back again, you will see inside this visitor center, there is a beautiful canoe. And it was actually built for Franklin over 110 years ago. And uh, even today, there are members of the Roosevelt family who still have that friendship with the Passamaquoddy natives. So they taught Franklin how to sail. Um, Eleanor loved it up here because this was the first home that she could call her own. So the Roosevelt Park is one. I would never miss Heron Cove. The Heron Cove Provincial Park is spectacular. The beach there is a mile and a half long. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. And by saying Heron Cove too, that also includes that nine hole golf course. There's something very magical about that, golfing that course and overlooking the Bay of Funday and the working herring wares in that area. Of course, Head Harbor Light, that's a huge draw. The lighthouse, of course, is only accessible at low tide. Mm -hmm. So you actually, you know, you, it requires some physical fitness up and down the ladders to get over to that lighthouse. But lots of times, even if you're not able to get to the lighthouse, make sure you go down and you see that lighthouse because oftentimes in July and August, you can watch the whales right from that parking lot, which is incredible. So, and you can see the lighthouse. You may have not gotten to it, but you've certainly gotten to enjoy a lot of the things that they would do. I would always recommend anyone that visited Campobello to go to Head Harbor Wharf. Well, it started doing this uh, in 1995, so it's 25 years now. But uh, yeah, I just love uh, meeting the people. Uh, I'm a fisherman, so I love being on the water. And we see uh, minky whales. Uh, we've had a few finback whales, some humpback whales. Uh, and we even had a young right whale uh, up in here spend a day with us uh, this season. And we watch a lot of the same whales year after year. Some of these whales have been coming back for 20 years. So it's almost like you build a friendship with them. And I would always go up to Mahalan Point Light yeah. too. It's beautiful. And remember when you go to Mahalan Point Light that there was an older gentleman that used to go to work and move back in the morning and he would light the lighthouse at night when he come back from work. And then of course in the morning he would put it out. So that was part of his daily routine, just going, I'm just going back and forth work, but on my way, I think I'll tend to this lighthouse, which mm -hmm. is always so nice. Mm -hmm. that, and you can see the, the border community is, is so obvious at that yes. part of Campobello, where yep. you see that the communities truly are one, um, the U.S. and the Canadian they side. Are. Mm -hmm. And you're speaking of locals who are fascinating characters on the yeah. island. It's it's hard to believe there are only around 900 people that live there. Yeah, considering yeah. the the um, standout characters I've had to meet every time <laughs> I'm there. With well, the hairs, the hairs actually were Dennis and Margaret exactly. Hare. They're wonderful. They, it's so nice to see people that are not necessarily from the island yeah. fall in love with the area and become a part of the community. Well, you know, we, we have always loved the people of Campobello and New Brunswick. We just find that it's, it's a big change from Indiana. We love Indiana too, the Hoosiers there, but uh, you know, the people have a lot to do with it. The beauty and the unspoiled beauty, uh, it's a little harder to get to. Uh, uh, so by being a little bit harder to get to, there's not as many people. So uh, that makes it nice. And then the wildlife in front of the cottages, the whales, the seals, the eagles, I mean, once you sit on your deck and see whales coming out of the water one or two times, you think, wow, this is kind of, it's kind of neat. Because so, you just can't do that. Even if you have an oceanfront property, a lot of properties wouldn't have them right in front of you. More Canadians are coming. And I used to ask Canadians who did come back years ago, uh, why don't more people from Canada come? And they said, well, they just didn't know about Campobello. And they just, if they were going to go on a vacation, they just kept going south and they went into Maine and into Cape Cod and then went on down to North Carolina. You know, they just kept driving instead of just staying in their own backyard, which this year has given them the opportunity to do. And the reviews that we've been getting have been fantastic.
think I met them on a wharf and ended up back at their house as one would do in yes, Campobello. Yeah, that's how um, it works. <laughs> they showed me their sea glass collection, which I know we're mostly talking about Fog Fest today, yeah. but the island does have a wonderful sea glass festival. That's in September, I believe, and it is a, a great place to find it sea glass. It is, and actually one of Fog Fest board members um, began the Sea Glass Festival on Campobello, Stephanie Anthony. She does all of their marketing for us through Fog Fest. When is Fog Fest this year? Is it New Brunswick Day weekend? Oh, is we that? always do New Brunswick Day weekend. Okay. We picked that weekend because we knew that the campground already would have some people in it. Um, local residents, um, John and Angel Smart, mm -hmm. They have a group of friends that had always come in the past, New Brunswick Day weekend, and there would be a lot of them in the campground. And we thought, well, we'll do it that weekend because those we know those people are there. And we're going to have music and entertainment. It would kind of be nice to add something to their stay because they have for so many years come to, to visit with us. So we've always kept it New Brunswick weekend. We'll open with our opening ceremony on the 28th of July, and we'll run through to... August 1. Oh, wonderful. So, and yeah. um, looking back at the year we've had, um, why do you think so many people discovered Campobello um, that were Canadian? I know that I understand from a tourism perspective there was a lot of worry that maybe you might be one of the most troubled places in New Brunswick over the course of the borders being closed. I think that probably largely in that part due to the marketing, we uh, Kim Herlin does our webpage and she does a great job with that. Fog Fest helps a lot because, of course, we're drawing from the province. So if you're bringing somebody from Fredericton, well, they're gonna tell somebody and so on and so on. And I think word of mouth. Uh, some people happen upon Fog Fest mm -hmm. by a mistake and some people come because it's their destination. And then they discover so much more when they get there. Mm -hmm. And it keeps bringing them back to the area, which is, really wonderful. You know, would Facebook be the best way if people want to keep in touch with what's going on and maybe what acts are being added to the roster this year? Would yes. following on Facebook be the yeah. best way? I would say, I would always suggest following our, on following us on Facebook. Stephanie's always so on top of that. Of course, we have our Campobello Fog Fest page as well, but really Facebook is yeah, it's a great way to keep in touch with what's happening in our area. And who knows, maybe we will be welcoming our American friends back sooner than later too. My guest today has been Teresa Mitchell, Chair of the Campobello Island Tourism Board and also a board member of FogFest. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for watching Southwest Magazine.